Um, my name is Liz, and I use the pronouns she, they, and... And I'm Al, and my pronouns are they, them, there. And we are so excited to be here, and we just want to do a quick note that we are trying to adhere to the CDC safety guidelines and remain six feet apart and in a wide space. And aside from that, we hope that y'all are adhering to the CDC guidelines too, because we're all in this together. So on June 19th, which is Juneteenth, Al and I, we created something that means a lot to us. And we hope that later today we'll be able to create something that means a lot to you as well as us. So on June 19th, which is Juneteenth, we created these projections and we projected the words Black Lives Matter, support black lives, respect black lives, and defend black lives, as well as projecting the Juneteenth flag on the Vance Monument. And so at the same time, we were projecting onto the Astro Art Museum and the words Queer Black Lives Matter and Defend Black Lives in addition to images of Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, uh, and Marsha P. Johnson. Since June was Pride Month, we also included the words of Micah Bazant that say, Pride for none of us, without liberation for all of us. And that for us represents points on the spectrum of truth and hope, but more about that in a minute. So right now we want to give you a little preview of a projection that we've been using recently and just kind of give you a how-to on how we actually do these projections. And so here we go. <laughs> large-scale public projections. So first thing we did was found a projection site and tonight we're going to be projecting onto the site of the Asheville Art Museum. So we parked a truck, we packed our bags, and we brought our stuff. And the stuff includes a laptop, a power converter, power, a projector, suitcase to carry all this. Oh yeah, me! Wow! That was gonna take me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So once we have the phone, HDMI cable, very important as well, and power cords. Yeah. All right. So we also have the option if for some reason our sweet little deep cycle marine battery runs out, we can hook this whole system up to the truck, which is another reason we do it in the bed of a beach. And that was part one of how we set up. Stay tuned for part two. Welcome to part two of how we do public projections. Welcome back. So now that we have all our things together in one place, we're gonna hook them all up. Liz? All right, so first you get your computer, you get your HDMI cable, and then you, tell me, uh, you hook it up going over to the uh, projector. And while you're hooking it up to the projector, if there's another person, they can, Al, hook up your power. So we're using a 750 watt power converter. That's more than enough to um, power this projector and even a laptop, even though we come ready with a pre-charged laptop. Um, but what that does is that means that we can then hook up this deep cycle marine battery. And the reason I keep saying that is because deep cycle marine battery batteries work better than car batteries. They are designed to give a lower amount of um, power over a longer amount, amount of time. Um, work super well for what we're doing. So once we have that picked up, we're going to turn on our power converter, plug in our power cord, and then plug in the projector. Here we go. Hey David, how are you? Make sure everything's snug. 
All right. And now we're gonna go to part three, the protection. Welcome back to part three. We missed you. So we're gonna do the protection now, y'all. Are you ready? Here we go. One. Thanks for checking that out. And I want to give a quick shout out to Quay Mills for modeling and for Alice Scott's awesome drone footage. And this projection was basically to speak on the intersectionality that affects a multitude of areas of black lives. Because if you want to bring up one aspect of black lives and expect change, you can't. You have to bring them all up because they all inform each other. And so I wanted to make this list of demands to demand us to all be loud about all of the schism, about the schism of inequities that we face, especially the black community and the black indigenous people of color community. So George Floyd's death was a powder cake was the light to the powder cake that informed that we need to address this. And when the protest started, Al and I, we knew that we wanted to join in the fight. And one way that we wanted to be involved was through art. So since making art during my adulthood, I was more of a wallflower and an introvert. And outside of customer service, I was uh, quite happy with that and just creating my own little practice of escapism. But after 2016, I definitely felt the need to create protest work that spoke on all that I was feeling. But I just kept going towards a feeling of fear and anger. And so by 2018, I was pretty desensitized to creating any work outside of that. So I just kind of shut down and I created more work that didn't really have any meaning, but still it kept me kept me alive in one way or another. But in 2018, I was looking at my email and I saw that there was this newsletter from Campaign for Southern Equality, and we'll call it CSE from here on out. And it's basically a call for design for LGBTQ pride because it was June. And so I was so excited to actually have an avenue to create work that was bright and cheerful and actually was a form of protest. So I decided to make like five designs and I made these inclusive and bright, loving designs that actually won. And I was elated and they became t-shirts and posters and that was cool. And then in 2019, I was invited to do uh, print work for CSC for their annual fundraiser, Y'all Meet All. And I was elated about that. I went to the fundraiser. Everybody was super warm and friendly. And I was like, cool. Well, that's, that's, that That was one day. So, But I'll, I'll put it in my back pocket. But then Jasmine Beach Barrera, who's the executive director, reached out to me and said, art has a space in the social justice movement and campaign for Southern Equality. We want to create this space for that. And we want to start up an artist in residence program. And we want you and Al to be a part of this. And so I said, absolutely. And through that, I was able to collaborate with multiple people throughout the, uh, throughout the South who were a part of the LGBTQ community. And Al and I, we worked on a series that was called Uprooted, and it was informed by people's origins and how those influenced their current safe spaces. And that was great because it created a stronger bond of community and made me push out of being an uh, introvert. And I've also created other projects. And all these projects helped me because I've always created work that spoke on 
my journey for hope, but usually it was towards fear and darkness while I was looking for hope. And this direction, which I badly needed, it actually brought me towards love and optimism and hope. Hmm. So I really wish I had worn one of those shirts, actually. <laughs> Uh, when when Jasmine and I reached out to Liz about doing work, um, I had read this interview where Liz described her work as a technicolor love letter to the world. And I was just immediately struck by her seemingly openness to doing something, representing herself in a way that was loving and sweet and tender um, and weird. <laughs> Which is my favorite part. Um, and, and then when we worked together on the show of Rooted, it was, it was like something I hadn't experienced in a really long time, not since college, when everything was personal and awkward. Um, had I done anything that had anything to do with how I felt or who I was? Um, so before CSE, for about four years, I ran a metalworking um, business. And it was entirely commission-based, commissioned um, by other people, about other people, for other people, uh, and I did it alone, and that was very important. Um, and in retrospect, I realized that it wasn't exactly what I wanted. I was actually really sad. Um, nonetheless, when that business closed, I was devastated. And I didn't tell anybody because I was super embarrassed. I felt like a failure. Um, but I just assumed that given all the pain um, and the resentment around that closure, that I just wouldn't do metal work again. Um, I didn't have the heart for it. I didn't have the stomach for it. Um, it was just going to be something that I had done for a bit. Fast forward to CSE, where art and storytelling and creativity is in all parts of our movement. Um, and we use it for our work in so many ways for LGBTQ equality across the South. And it really solidified in Southern Equality Studios. And so this work with Liz was this second chance that I didn't even know I wanted. And all of a sudden, I was thinking of my studio as this way to tell my story, to help other people tell their stories. And we were thinking of these projects to connect with queer community. And we felt so grounded, I think, because we started out very honest about where we were. Um, we were in this meeting, just the two of us, and we were planning for the show Uprooted. And we were trying to come up with lists of artists to collaborate with. And I remember maybe we came up with like a handful of our friends. And I was like, I don't know any more queer artists. Um, but I knew we were out there, and I was like, yeah, I don't have any more. So we realized we really needed um, to look at where that came from and where that could go. And so a lot of our work became about connection. Um, and so we went from really driven to, in my case, hide and create a barrier with my studio um, to the whole drive behind and, and what we created, traveling the spectrum all the way to connection and relationship. Uh, and I'm so glad it did. So after, me too. <laughs> and uh, after uh, that 2019 project, we worked to continue community and create a stronger community with Southern queer artists. But then the pandemic hit. And we attempted to create a connection with people locally and outside of Asheville, virtually, and also create a place for hope. And then, in rapid succession, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. And then Breonna Taylor was murdered. And then George Floyd was murdered. And I felt a deep depression and a rage, and I knew that I wasn't alone. And I knew that I needed to be in community because I was making self-expressive art and it wasn't really 
connecting the way that I wanted it to. And I knew that in order to process how I was feeling, I needed to find a way to go and honor the lives that were stolen and that shook this world, this country, and this community. And I felt heartbroken. And I felt furious. And I felt ashamed. I like this had been happening. This had happened before. We knew this was happening to other folks that we weren't even hearing about, we hadn't heard about yet. Um, and and I had just question after question after question. And so I went to a protest and shouted, and that was cathartic. And then I went to a vigil and I spoke there. And that was cathartic, but more was needed to heal. Because after the protest began, and after the curfew was implemented on this city, the community, especially the black community, felt a violence and a trauma forced upon us during this COVID pandemic. And I was at home with, with five-month-old twins and my wife, and texting with people who were at these demonstrations and vigils about what they could do if they got tear gas or what streets to avoid as they were walking home because we had reports of people throwing explosives off of rooftops and I just felt very not useful um, and completely ineffective at doing anything about what had been happening to black and brown folks for far too long. And so we found a way to do something. We found a way to show the wide range of experiences that we are all going through. Because in the middle of this rage, this righteous rage, we also knew that there is a space that needed to be created to show our grief and to pay our respect for the lives that were stolen. And so aside from that, we also created a call to action and we found different spots of Asheville and we pinpointed these spots for us as citizens and community members needed to push against in order to create change. Because we live in a society that is fueled by systemic racism and white supremacy. And at times, hope and fear can coexist. And also, at times, there are certain truths that only come to the surface during times of oppression and darkness. And this was that moment, and this was that time. So, and so we had we had thought of projections before, but at this point, we hadn't had any real necessity to try to figure out exactly how to make them happen. And and so the projections were an answer for us, a beginning of an answer for us about how to ask what does our hope look like right now and how do we start to make it happen. And so I created these images based off of the people who were violently murdered. And I did this because I wanted to go past the one-dimensional portrayals that I kept seeing in the news because I didn't really honor people. That meant so much in so many different ways. And so I tried to create elements of light and warmth and love and hope in these images, as well as produce a call to action that demanded that we work towards ending the injustice and the inequalities that we have. And it really meant a lot to me, and I hope that it came across that way. Yeah. And I and I wanted to address the burden that was on black and brown communities to stand in the public sector and demand justice in person to gather, gathering at a time when it's already dangerous for the usual reasons for them to do so. And then on top of that, we had COVID-19, and it just felt like injustice was compounding injustice. And I wanted to help and I was hyper aware of my whiteness. And that's not an awareness that my community always asks of me. And so 
heightening my awareness of how I participate in white supremacy was embarrassing and confusing at times and important and significant, and it raised alarm bells about how I ought to act and how I ought to participate in that moment. Um, and so a part of me wanted to hide and do, like, safe, intellectual, quiet work where I didn't risk being wrong or inserting myself where I shouldn't be. Um, but as Liz and I talked, like, it was apparent that that was not going to do anything to really actualize hope here. And so I knew that I could work out the mechanics of these projections. I knew I could figure out the logistics. I knew I could organize the crap out of it. Um, and so I figured out my purpose and where I fit. And my purpose was to be honest about my truth while lifting up this. And so we found ourselves on totally opposite states of being on this spectrum. And every, in bet- every, every place in between you can imagine um, at the same time as we were embarking on this project. And so that brings us to the theme of our talk, Spectrum. As Al and I continued to talk, we realized that we kept coming back to this idea that in order to have our spectrum, it requires relationships. And in order for us to know where we land on that spectrum, that requires something of us. It requires us speaking our truth, shining the light on it, and being witness to other people's truths. Because sometimes the most revolutionary thing that you can do is to speak your truth. And sometimes that is to connect with somebody else, and sometimes that is to create hope. And so I guess we don't always think of we don't always think of truth and hope as existing on spectrums, but they do, or they can. Um, and one thing we know and have learned in this process is that there's no monolithic voice for any given community, right? There's there's no one voice for the for black folks, for for queer folks, for Asheville. Um, and so Liz and I knew that to be as artists, a moving force for positive change, we had to consider a collective voice and also collectives of voices. In order to do that, we had to reach out to folks most affected at and around the demonstrations and by expressions of violence, and then to listen to what they were saying. Sometimes the best thing that one can do for another is to know each other and to know each other's hopes because if we know each other's hopes, that gives us a chance to actually create that as a reality. Imagine something good can happen or to, to want that good thing to happen that you think actually might, like that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about hope here. Um, and so Liz and I were on the Zoom call a few months ago, imagine that. Uh, and there was this organizer on there who was super intense and who said, I don't believe in hope, it's worthless. Um, and we're all like, wait, what? But what they were really saying was, Hope without action is worthless. Um, hope, relying solely on hope, um, is misdirected. Um, hope by itself is worthless. And I, I still disagree, um, for myself, anyway, about that. Because I believe that to have hope, you have to be creative. You have to be creative. You have to have a creativity. You have to be able to imagine something that was, that isn't, or something that could be that isn't yet. And also, it doesn't stop there. If you have the creativity to hope, then you have what it takes to think about what you might do to bring that to fruition. And that's why we're sharing this process. Because this is our response to those questions. And we want to know what you hope. We want to know what you're willing to do to make it happen. And that's why we're here. Initially, when 
we began this project, I wanted to go and create portraits for all the lives that had been stolen. But the numbers horrifically grew so quickly that I couldn't process and it was becoming too traumatic to continue that idea. So I went to another part of the spectrum of creating work that's hopeful and meaningful. And I visited and revisited members of the past and of the present who were black, queer, and trans artists, singers, writers, activists, organizers. And I used quotes from them to help light a fire in us to continue to work tirelessly towards trying to create change despite all of these obstacles. And in the words of Nina Simone, during this crucial time when everything is so desperate and every day is a matter of survival, I don't think one can help but be involved. How can you be an artist and not reflect these times? I don't think that we have a choice and that to me is the definition of being an artist. This year is pivotal in so many ways and initially we wanted to create a way to honor those lost and then also to have a call to action for people to be proactive in their communities. But we also found that aside from echoing these calls to action, we also needed to echo inspirations of hope because there are people who have places in themselves where hope is disappearing or at this point non-existent. And we need hope and we needed to create the belief that we can create this change because we need to create the future that we want to see and prop up the people who have worked so hard against these huge odds. So, so what is the spectrum of hope here? Honestly, my hope is that my kids won't have a reason to protest police brutality or monuments to white supremacy. And that if in their lifetime they do, and they probably will, that they do it as accomplices to the communities most affected by them. And that they show up fully honest about their own truth. My hope is that with every setback that 2020 brings us, we're also reminded of our resilience. Uh, and my hope is that for our community, we can feel disoriented and lost and feel freed to choose a better path. And my hope is that after this election, that we won't say this person won or this person won, I guess my job here is done. Because wherever there is a place of injustice, there's a place of injustice everywhere. And I hope that we continue to be the players in this infinite game that continue to push towards change and to push towards equality and equity for all of our siblings. My hope is that my body will not be seen as a weapon or a threat and that it will be seen as potential and progress. And so to make that happen, I will be an accomplice to black and brown folks. I will teach more than I produce. I will make art that tells you who I am and help you make art that tells us who you are. And I will listen, and I will not choose the path of least resistance. And to make that happen, I will continue to honor those who have, <laughs> who have uh, created the paths that have led us to where we are today, and continue to uplift those who work to build up these communities. I will create art, that speaks on this, be it through projection, design, photography. I will collaborate 
with my black, brown, queer, and trans siblings, and I will collaborate with whoever wants to be progressive and create change. I will listen, I will learn, and I will teach, and I will be a bridge. So we, we invite you to think about what we just did um, and what we just said. We, we said, my hope is, and to make that happen, I will. And we invite you to try that for yourself, whether you need to write it down or tell it to your or say it out loud or just think it. And let yourself land anywhere on this vast range of, of what hope can be. Um, and don't, don't stop, stop at the first part, because, because it's really easy to say, my hope is to make it through the day tomorrow, and stop and say, but I, I don't know how. Because the, the truth is, if you have the creativity to hope the first part, you have what it takes to finish the second part, or at least to start. So, my hope is, and to make it happen, I will. And so we're going to do something radical with you today, and we're going to ask you to shine a light on your truth and be witness to someone else's. So there's going to be a link dropped in the chat. Go to a thing called a Padlet. It's very cute. Um, and you're seeing that on your screen and behind us as well. That link will take you to a place where you can double-click on the screen to add a comment. And finish the prompt, my hope is, to make that happen, I will. Or you can click on the little pink plus sign on the bottom of your screen. Or you can follow along and do this later. And as this happens, we're going to sort of get an idea of, of a portrait of what our community hopes and what they're willing to do to make it happen. And we're going to put up these projections tomorrow in the Asheville Art Museum. And if you'd like to see it, hop onto Instagram and check out our channel at Southern Equality Studios and check out the Instagram TV. Also, you have until 12 p.m. today to continue to add answers and can add as many answers as you would like because the more hope, the better. And also, we can like other people's Padlet entries and Drink some coffee, have your walk, and add some more hope to this. Uh, so what does our community hope? Uh, what does this whole spectrum of hope and truth look like? This is us sort of doing a warm-up. This is our starting point. This is just one point on that spectrum of where we might go. So just ask yourself, how have I felt during these calls for racial justice? What have I experienced in the course of this pandemic? Have you told anybody about that? Have you asked anybody else about their experiences or their feelings? And then just go from there. We're all on this point. We're all points on the spectrum together. And, and, uh, the best that we can think to do right now is to ask people what their hope is and to make it bigger and to shine a light on it. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much, Liz and Al. We're gonna do some Q&A. That was so amazing. Thank you for being with us this morning and for that just incredibly empowering and inspiring message. Um, and I think we've got a few questions queued up um, and folks can still enter, um, put their responses in the Padlet. Uh, we'll switch over here to Q&A in just a, a second. Um, Harper's gonna help us uh, get some questions in front of Liz and Al. Uh, but that Padlet will remain open, accessible to everybody here through noon today. So if you want to add your my hope is, and to make that happen, I will. And, and then 
be able to possibly see it, uh, the projection tomorrow evening. Uh, that would be amazing. So big thank you again to Liz and Al. And I think we've maybe got a, a question for you. Okay, we're going to start with number one. And uh, what do you admire most about each other's creative processes? Do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'll start. So uh, basically, uh, I think that Al is a genius full of top shelf thoughts and ideas. And I'm always inspired and I always um, I feel the need to like push myself further and further when I'm working with Al. And also, I am a digital artist, so when I see all of this analog art that Al makes, I'm like, what? Huh? And then Al will say like something scientific or mechanical or engineering, and they're like, yeah, I have my like wielding stuff over here and the currents and all that, and I'm like, I press a couple of buttons here and there in Photoshop and do this. So yeah, I just want to better myself when I see Al's work and when I talk to Al. So uh, that's what I admire most about Al. It's really humbling to hear this because um, so I I too find myself like really trying to push. When I work with Liz, it's so the thing about Liz that is very, it feels like things come naturally and that you, you let yourself go on these adventures and it feels like this combination of like playing with your own wild ideas and engaging them and just following them where they take you and, and there's something super instinctual about it. So I admire that so much because I can be very intellectual and really dig into details Sometimes to my detriment. So I admire um, just how willing you are to go there and how, gosh, how fast you can be playful and focused and go off on tangents and then they become these beautiful roadmaps to something absolutely incredible. Shucks. Okay, so anyway, um, get in, how can people get involved and connected with this? I'll go for it. So that's a great question which is a million different ways. One, um, we'll start from the most specific and say that we have like this PDF guide of how to do these projections because when we figured this out, we really wanted to make sure we were sharing that information with as many people as possible. And basically, just getting this stuff um, is, the hardest, is the hardest thing. So if you want to do projections, we have a PDF guide. We're happy to help you learn how to set it up. We're happy to share um, sort of the framework for how we decide what we project, when we project, and um, where we project, because that's really intentional. Um, to be involved and connected with us, through Southern Equality Studios, we have an Instagram account at Southern Equality Studios. We do queer artist meetups each week. Um, you can join in on one of those, and there's various ways of connecting there as well. We have a Slack channel. Um, we have a signal thread. Um, otherwise, as we get bigger and bigger, um, CSC, the Campaign for Southern Equality, if you're curious about that work, you can check out the website. You can see some of the ways we're virtual now and some of um, the grant making process, processes that we're engaged in. Um, so you can also always reach out to me or Liz. We'd love to hear from you. You can get me at al at southernequality.org or Liz at southernequality. <laughs> What's inspiring you right now? Um, I definitely want to uh, explore different ways to express black joy, especially after what happened with Breonna Taylor, because uh, the odds are, they do seem huge, and we need to have hope, and we need to have joy in order to continue to be proactive. So looking for that is something that is definitely inspiring me. Yeah, I think, so that's, that's been a direction that's um, really invigorating, and also I think important to look at also um, black voices who are down and out a celebration of black community and blackness 
and how people of color, I, I think a lot of folks on social media are shouting out more people of color who are creative, who are writers, um, and really focusing a spotlight on voices that prior may not have been in the spotlight as much. Um, so I'm super inspired about how voices are, are coming into the spotlight. I, I'm excited to see young folks um, really being movers and shakers and, and maintaining momentum around demand that they have. Um, that's inspiring. It's inspiring to me um, how artists are more involved in social justice movements. And I think a lot more people are realizing that artists can be and are a catalyst for change.